So, it's the Science and Clinical Approaches to Aging by Dr. Avi Herskowitz. Only one in 5,000 Americans live past 100 years. In a few small communities around the globe, this number can reach as high as one in 10. Children of centurions are also more likely to live to 100 years. So we know that there is at least a genetic component, although healthy epigenetic influences in the long-lived communities include advanced social structure, good nutrition, lots of exercise, and usually red wine. Dr. Herskowitz's extensive training includes a medical degree from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, residencies in anatomic pathology and internal medicine, and fellowship training in cardiology at the Johns Hopkins Medical Center. During his 12 years at Johns Hopkins, he became associate professor of medicine and immunology and molecular microbiology, and he led a research team in the study of molecular and immun immunological mechanisms of inflammation, autoimmunity, ischemia, heart transportation, rejection, and congestive heart failure. Please welcome Dr. Herskowitz. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a great crowd tonight. Um, this is my third or fourth visit here, and I want to offer a, a deep sense of respect and gratitude I have for organizations like S SVHI. Um, it always comes to the IT, right? <laughs> no matter how sophisticated you are, yes? Yeah. Um, Organizations that, that who Okay, that's the lights. Okay. I told you that's now the lights, okay. Uh, organizations that focus on sharing with the public and sharing with practitioners new knowledge and how the reality will ultimately play out that integrative medicine is at least a fundamental part of the future of medicine deserves our respect and gratitude and support. Um, I currently uh, run, um, I'm president of the American College for Advancement of Medicine, ACAM, www.acam.org. It's around 48 years old, coming to 50 years old, old of age, and spawned a lot of the integrative societies in the United States, and not a commercialized entity like SGI. I applaud you, and I hope everyone has as good as time as I will have today. There's no subject that deserves a fusion between molecular science and an integrative lens than aging, because aging consumes much of all the, all the, all the repair we have combined. So, okay, so let's get rid of that annoying thing. Boom, boom. Okay. So, like it was said in that um, brief summary that I provided, I yeah, I have no. Um, the the goals that I have are to allow you to see the theories and the new language of aging, because over the next few years, you're going to hear words you haven't heard before. Um, uh, and we'll review all of those terms and why they're fundamentally important for you to understand where the future will go. And the future will go as all futures go. There'll be a commercial sector and there'll be a, a sector that, that's devoted to the, to, the, to the application to the general public. So we'll be focused on that tonight. Uh, review the new strategies for the new field of taking healthcare down to the cellular level, which is ultimately the goal anyway, but we'll focus our attention on that and understand the new layering, and I call it convergence of different technologies. We had a question on PEMF, we had a question on cognitive. They all need to be converged and layered together in order to have uh, a, a content organism, so to speak. A and then understand the importance, ultimately, for how we sit in this uh, sea of risk and, and, and exactly where we are it requires some level of screening and then some level of attention to how important it is to deal with certain pathways more than others because a hierarchy has to be developed. So ultimately, 
A strategy has to be developed. So the latest figures are that it's going to take us at least 12 more years for us in the United States and in Britain to live one extra year. So we're already at 75, 76, and the J Japanese are at 83, 82, but it's going to take us a long time to get to one extra year. So have we really reached the, the, our, life, our sort of general lifespan? And in, in the, the, the majority of the developed world, only one in every 5,000 persons are living past 100. And of course, there are, as I wrote in the summary, there are societies where that's a lot, a lot more prevalent. And we're going to understand a little bit how I use that information, because again, the majority of us are, don't have uh, those types of genetic predispositions and don't live uh, drinking fresh goat milk every day and drinking, unfortunately, only two glasses of red wine a night. So when I graduated from medical school, I needed a job but wanted to get a PhD degree. And so instead of getting a doctorate degree, which would force me to pay, you know, and get, get very few pay, I, I decided to do a, a year of residency in anatomical pathology at Albert Einstein, which was the best decision I ever made. And it, ultimately, I did the full residency and chief residency. And what we learned with the well, we, we as pathologists in the basement, you know those guys who no one likes to talk to, it's uh, dangerous to go down there because you know, never know whether you're going to come out alive. So what we learned was that there's very, very little difference with what the, eight, the true centenarians die from. They just die from the same diseases that we do, but they die 25 years later. So that's a fundamental observation. There's nothing new about them except they happen to be 25 years older than the average person. And they don't get ill until their 90s. This is sort of like what happens when the average American has at the end of lifespan, maybe in the late 70s. Very few Americans have no disease until they're past their 60s. There's almost no one who's on nothing except the crowd here. <laughs> so what they have is they have a functional reserve, and they have systems, the hypothesis is, they have systems that are on the reparative side most of life, whereas the general population loses those qualities in an earlier age, roughly 25 years earlier than the average person does. So what, what does that tell us about the secrets of how the genes control these factors and then how we can manipulate these factors onto our behalf, those of us that don't have the luxury of having this gene, uh, these genetics. But we know that there are genetic signatures or genetic clusters. These don't mean much to most everyone here, although some people are, are savvy to these particular genes, but they do represent the following. And this is a fundamental slide in the slide deck. So what do they deal with? They deal with contingency plans on the mitochondrial side that have efficiency built in and response to injury, injury built in. So they have multiple sets of pathways, more so than the average one of us do. do. They have a way of buffering into the correct amount of inflammation, because we obviously need inflammation to repair. And they have a way of buffering, uh, uh, buffering these systems that they don't overreact to stimuli. There is a fundamental nature of having glucose sensitivity in multiple different pathways. So, so nutrient sensitivity is a fundamental part of uh, centenarians. They know, they know how to tell the difference and they know how to guide cells to either be um, progenitor cells or, or duplicating cells and how to, how to get rid of senescent cells. And I'll get into senescence quite a lot because this is going to be, this is a big, big topic of development over the, over the last 10 years. And then they know, they know, they have multiple pathways towards autophagy. These are two of the pathways I'll talk to today. But 
Autophagy is basically a cell saying, I've had enough, I'm going to get engulfed, and I'm going to be eliminated from the body. It's, uh, the, fun, the fundamental definition of detoxification would be a cell that is leaving at the right time in the right place. So what are the hallmarks of aging? It's genomic instability. You've heard of the telomere story. I will say that some of the illest patients that we see, and we have quite a lot of ill patients from all over the world come to see us at, at, at uh, Tyra Madison in San Francisco, um, there's a disconnect between telomere lengths and overall health. So it's not a, it's not a linear relationship. Just understand that. And the laboratories that, 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 that function in this space are not yet ready for true prime time. We're not ready to, to, to screen a million patients because it would be a waste of dollars right now to do that. So I wouldn't go with this, but fundamentally, it is a shortened telomere is associated with more DNA injury. We have epigenetic alterations, and I'll have my colleague, Dr. Lee, talk a lot about these as it pertains to cancer but it's really a similar discussion as it relates to aging. And then loss of protein uh, structure. So many of the neurodegenerative diseases now are related with protein misfolding, and there's nothing to, um, there's nothing to, to buttress that. But they have genetic pathways that are more apt to produce what's called now chaperone proteins that will guide the proteins back into normal folding. Then there's dysregulated nutrient sensing. Listen, it's, you know, God made it this way. Sugar is sugar. And uh, the way we process sugar today is just not the right way. So what we're feeding ourselves is just not right. So in, as I say, in our, in our world where the sun comes up and it's yellow, this is the way it is. So uh, we have to have a very strong nutrient sensing capability and this is also a function of this mTOR, this mammalian target for rapamycin story of, of how it senses the environment. And when the environment isn't right, then the cell undergoes a normal pathway towards death instead of sitting around and ruining the neighborhood, basically. Mitochondrial dysfunction, I'll, by the time I, I'm done with this lecture tonight, I think I'll, I'll try to convince everyone that that is the the master conductor of the orchestra, but it needs a lot of players involved in order to ultimately lead to healthier lifespan, or health span as we now call it, or early accelerated aging. And then the concept of senescence, which we now understand is a cell that goes from normal pr production of normal productivity and then into a state where it's becoming a bit uh, less efficient, and then ultimately systems shut down, but it still functions, but it's not doing what it's supposed to do, and then it's signaling in the neighborhood, as we say, that it's, it's a pro-inflammatory state, and it's a pro productive state that it wants to join other cells uh, to, the, to the neighborhood and then ruins the neighborhood. And ultimately, it's these senescent cells that become mutated, and ultimately, over time, it's these senescent cells that largely become our tumors in the future. So if we had, as they have, the ability to get rid of these senescent cells more rapidly or delay the onset for 25 years, then we will end up to be able to mimic the centenarians. There's also another one I didn't have time to put it in, which is an overload of our innate stem cell capability because our functional repair systems are always supported by our own innate organ-specific stem cells, and when you, over, when you overload them, you age, of course, but they're also overloaded in this setting, and they have more, more of these systems in place. So the new language we'll get into a little bit later, but everything on this list is now in the thousands of publications annually. So understanding the system is the most important feature. Everyone in this audience understands the concept of system biology, because you're all here interested in integrative forms of thinking. Uh, but this is the fundamental diversion between my position at Hopkins and at UCSF versus my position in front of you today, is that I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to 
not think about the whole system. And I'm not going to drive short-term effects at the expense of long-term equilibrium. So what does that sort of mean? It's a trivial observation that we all had that if your knee hurt from osteoarthritis and you took an Advil and, then, and the pain went away, that's fundamental. Everyone's had some experience like that. But then the pain comes back the next day. And why is that? Because Advil is not dealing with the, the osteoarthritic component fundamentally. And the observation is that it's taken you many, many years to develop the arthritis. It didn't happen overnight. So unless you deal with the systems that provided you with that ultimate symptom, the symptom didn't happen from, from an event yesterday, unless you got hit by a bus, of course, or, or unless you got something that happened truly acutely. That's a whole different story. This is not the paradigm for the flu. This is the paradigm for all the chronic illnesses. But it's fundamental, and that's one of the things that, that the, the current system, which is outstanding for acute care, doesn't fall, falls, falls largely inadequate for chronic care. So we have a communications network, and there are many different types. There are persons in the audience that are experts in physical medicine. Uh, there are folks in the audience that are focused on oral health. But these are the systems that are all intertwined. And when I, when I first did pathology, I recognized that these systems were, f were very complicated and difficult to absorb and digest. But it has to ultimately come down, in my opinion, to what's driving the energetic, f what's driving energy utilization and productivity in an individual cell. Otherwise, you can't get clusters of cells to talk to each other properly, et cetera, et cetera. But it comes down to cellular medicine. So today, we're going to focus a little bit on these mitochondria and these, uh, these, secre these secretory lysosomes, which are the, basically the, the way cells communicate with one another. But I want to take a bit of a European approach as well and explain the importance of this, which is the, the, the bath, the soup within cells live. They live within the extracellular matrix, and this is what the homeopaths from two, three hundred years ago were talking about in the anatomist. They said, what is going on here? It seems like a whirlwind of activity. Look at all this. This is a hundred, a thousand, a thousand power photomicrograph a cartoon of, and there are 14, 15 different cell types. And it's sort of like the distance between going from the left side of your toe to the right side of your toe is roughly the same distance as you would be driving from Munich to Frankfurt on the Autobahn, and you could either be going on the Autobahn on a superhighway, or you could be going on a dirt road. So when you're going on a dirt road, you're not as efficient. It's going to take you a lot longer time. The amazing part of it is the body still works with very poor extracellular matrices. It works with a poor environment, but it works less efficiently, and you will age in, a d in an accelerated fashion. So you have to worry about both, but let's focus today on, cellular, on the cellular health component. The complexity. This is what I call it goes against the arrogance principle that we have in, in the high academic world, which we decided 40 years ago that we knew a lot, but we knew so much that we were able to advance a whole logical system, which is basically a receptor-based system, that I would, I would ultimately think of a disorder as a single receptor disorder as a single genetically modified disorder. And we now know that that's wholly untrue, except for very rare disorders. So if you understand that, then you don't have to be arrogant enough to understand how crazily complicated this stuff is. 70 trillion cells that are talking to each other. If, you, if I stub my toe here, my brain will you know, we'll, we'll, we'll know it instantly, you know, in, in, in astoundingly fast speeds. And then it's a function of genetics and epigenetics. But there are also many more mitochondria and bacteria around that are also communicating with us. And, and it's nice to ultimately have a way of simplifying them. So in order to simplify it, you can't go and, and, and shoot a gun at the board and say, I'm going to hit that little piece, and then something will pop out the other side. And that, that's an hour discussion in and of itself. So let's focus this on age-related disorders. We all have some components of these. 
except we all want to be like the centenarians as long as they're drinking wine and they're cognitively aware and they're dancing in the social halls every night and they're, and they're gardening in the morning. That's a good scene, right? We all want that. Um, we, what, what, I th what I feel most of us are most afraid of is to live longer because our medications allow us to do that, but we're, in, we're truly impaired. We're truly in discomfort. We're truly cognitively aware. So this was an old joke in cardiology when I ran a heart institute for five years looking at the standards of care in the world for cardiac surgery. And when the surgeons checked the box that the case was successful, around 15% of people were cognitively impaired enough that they didn't recognize who their wife was when they, when they, when they were discharged, but that was considered to be a success. Now, maybe the wives thought it was a success too, but you know, that was a different story. <laughs> so this is, the most important, this is the most important slide here. So who are we as an entity that you would think about related to how healthy I am or how unhealthy I am? It's down, it's down to, the, to the cell. It's, it's more about the person, which is the cellular terrain, a person with, then, then, then becomes a person with organ-specific pathology. But it's a system in the cell that drives the pathology that you ultimately manifest in different parts of your body, depending on any number of variables. So again, we're going to focus on these little guys, these mitochondria, which are more likely not uh, driven originally from the involvement of bacteria, co-involvement with us in every cell, and then some of the uh, communications network. And we know what the drivers of accelerated aging are. Everyone in the audience understands these. But I'm going to try to take the next half an hour and talk about how we decelerate aging, understanding that this is what accelerates it. Let's take it from a different perspective and figure this stuff out in a systematic way. Okay. So you've heard the mitochondrial basis for aging. It's been published you know, over and over again now and, and with, with tremendous focus. When I first opened Anatara Medicine in 2011, um, I decided that I wanted to run, uh, we had a nonprofit as well because I've been in the social sector, nonprofit sector for many years before then, and looked around for PhDs who had experience with mitochondrial function because I thought that that was a reasonable hypothesis to pursue. I could not find a single postdoctoral fellow to, to, to interview. Today, if I put the same ad in, I'd have hundreds and hundreds of applications, particularly to be, to be relocated to San Francisco. But here, here you go. It's a mitochondrial basis for aging. Um, it's basically associated with all age-related disorders, and yes, our mitochondria get lower in number, they get less efficient, and we'll be able to show this in great detail in a few minutes. But th this is ultimately, I'm a structure person. I love looking under the microscope. I mean, I love it. it you get immersed in what's going on and you understand that nothing is so simple. Nothing can be set down to a single receptor because the complexity here is mind-numbing. So ultimately, the structure is these little things that look like earthworms, right? <laughs> but they're not. They're called Christi. And it's in there that is the apparatus that dictates whether or not we're going to be alive 60 seconds from now or not. So ultimately, those of us that have been trained in biology or chemistry, we hate this slide. We hate the Krebs cycle. We can't stand it because we always remember it and then forget it the next day. And this is not being cognitively impaired. So this is just being angry that this exists for us to memorize all the time. But basically, the, the only things that I want you to remember is that, you, you know, you, you do get sugar, go, glucose goes into the system, so do fatty acids go into the system to feed it. There are other nutrients as well, like amino acids and so on. But then you have oxygen that feeds it. And ultimately, what comes out is ATP. And you get some um, waste products. You get some reactive oxygen species. You get, you get hydrogen. You get some other stuff in there. 
And as long as you deal with the stuff properly, you're in good shape, and your heart will be beating in the next five seconds. So this is, comes from uh, Dr. Hazel Zeto. The Zeto, the S, the Zeto Schiller peptides are, are now widely recognized as the, the peptides that are leading the forefront of direct communications between a, an, amino, an amino acid chain and mitochondria. So she, this is her slides, and I want to give her credit for these. Uh, she talked about this at the latest ACHEM meetings in, in October. But basically, it's ATP. It's all about ATP and, and how much reactive oxygen species it delivers while it's doing its job. And so as you age, of course, it's a simple diagram to remember. But this is interesting. We make 65 kilograms a day of ATP. So basically, most of you make your own weight in, AT in ATP a day. So it's a probably a pretty important piece of stuff. You know, to, it's probably fundamental, and it is, um, it is fundamental. And um, different organs have different uh, abilities. Cardiac and skeletal muscle and brain it works more than, than thyroid, for example. So we have these systems here that say it's a unifying hypothesis for age-related ailments. And we're looking at the body as a rechargeable battery. The thing about the battery is that it's recharging millions of times a second, maybe billions of times a second. So it's astounding that this is the system that we've evolved to, and yet it's governed by certain basic principles that we're going to review over the next 10, 15 minutes. But basically, this is, the, this is the distribution, and ultimately, this is what an aged person looks like. And what we're trying to do is get a structure and a, and a um, strategy for how we can take ourselves and move us into the other curve to the, to the the different curve. And you'll see an interesting way of putting it by Dr. Zetto um, here. So this is the stuff that we don't like. But basically, all I want you to know is that you have a complicated set of complexes, one, two, three, four, five complexes that are talking to each other and producing uh, with oxygen, ultimately leading to ATP. The thing you have to remember here is, again, God did this. It's not me. So you need to understand the, the fundamental nature of this substance called NAD, nicotinamide adenine nucleotide, because it'll come up over and over again, and there'll be drugs that specifically designed to, to energize our NAD. It's just difficult. It's a difficult compound to work with. We give it intravenously in the, in the office for varying different disorders, including super athletes who want to compete at a higher level that's not uh, professional. But this is what I want you to remember. It's complicated, and it requires certain specific factors that lead to the production of ATP. So this is not to memorize again. Uh, this is, would be otherwise considered to be a formal stress test for my cardiology friends in the audience. Um, but here is the important thing. Fatty acids, which obviously the good fats are fundamentally more, you know, more important than the bad fats, but amino acids. Now, glucose gives you, ultimately leads to 2 ATP. Fatty acids lead to 32 ATP. That's very more efficient. But both, and all of our normal cells can do both. And as Dr. Lee will say in her talk, uh, ultimately cancer cells can only derive energy through the glucose pathways as a general rule. But then there are other things that are fundamental. You say, well, why, you know, why is everyone putting B vitamins in all the vitamins? Who, ca who cares? Why do I have to care about that? Why, 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 do I, why should I care about magnesium? I mean, who cares? But that's the way God made it. And the, the reason is here there are, um, let's see, yeah. yeah. Oh, the, the coloration is difficult here. But the B vitamins also enter into the same cycles that ultimately produce more ATP. That's why. We care. Some people need it more than others, but everyone needs it because you will be more efficient when you have a, an appropriate level of these things. But without the appropriate healthy fats, as the industry plummeted our total cholesterol to, to 110, 120, 
by giving us those the, the, the appropriate medications that we felt were appropriate but, but weren't, weren't designed to, to, to deal with the fact that we need phospholipids in all of our cell membranes. So ultimately, and we need amino acids. The trouble with this stuff is, is that our nutrient supply, as Dr. Lee will say, is so poor and so pathetically g genetically modified, so to speak, that we're, we, when you think you have, you go, I'm going to the farmer's market every Sunday, but you better measure at some point in your life what your levels are because you may or may not have the appropriate levels. You may not. So you need to fix it if you don't because these are fundamental. This is not to be joked around with. You cannot go forward and backward at the same time. And now there's literature to suggest that the, fatty, the, the carnitine specifically also drives some of this efficiency. And again, uh, the literature seems to be clear. Just note it, you know, read up on it on your cells, and some of you may want to take carnitine. Those of you in particular that want to pump up and be very performance oriented will probably end up on amino acids and carnitine. But it's because it's feeding the system more efficiently that ultimately produces more ATP and more energy. So the thing for this is that the structure is not flat. It's a three-dimensional structure, and these cristae oppose one another because the action is in the middle here. The action is in the communication between these. One plus one is not equal to, or, or in the impeachment inquiry, two plus two is not four, it's five. Here is a fundamental experiment that will become more popular as time goes by. And just look at the top line. These are mice with hearts. This is mitochondria, what they look like under electron microscope. This is what they look like 22, 22 months later with two months of sailing. This is basically an aged 75-ish year old equivalent to human life. But this is someone that's received that, this particular peptide that can communicate directly with mitochondria. So it looks pretty nice and young. And so it's possible to make things more efficient if you talk to the mitochondria in a way that's coherent. In this case, they will, there, is, there are a family of peptides being developed throughout the world that may be able to do this, and one of them may be better than others. We, we, we're, yet to, we're yet to know. But it's an exciting time. So aging is a decline in, in the ability to produce ATP and et cetera. So we're, we're going to, too slowly, so let me wrap it, you know, let me increase the pace, but this is sort of where everyone wants to be. Say, so, okay, we're here, we want to go here, but wait a second, if you're telling me that there's a fundamental uh, driver of whether or not my cell is going to be older tomorrow than today, then maybe uh, this is possible. And of course, I'm here to tell you that we're nowhere close to being there, number one. Number two is I wouldn't bank my whole life on it. And, and the fountain of youth is still a, a very nice aspiration. But we, we will have, instead of one, a one drug, a one herb, or a one, uh, uh, a one work uh, sort of philosophy, we're going to do it sequentially and, and strategically. So we'll go into this. So you can't do it alone. The mitochondria can't do it alone. So you're going to see in the literature this entire battery of things called sirtuins. And they are our, so when you read the literature, you'll see that they're, call, they're putting it in business terms so we could all understand them because ultimately they want us to buy compounds that, that, that deal with this gene pathways. But basically, they're the CEOs, and then the NAD that has to work with it is like the chief financial officer. So I find it funny that they're putting it in terms like this. But at least we can understand them. And again, the reason we're not going to understand it very easily is because it's, y you could spend an entire lifetime dealing with any one of these pathways. And for example, here are the sirtuin pathways. And you'll notice one thing if you were careful enough to memorize the few list of the genetic pathways that centenarians have, is that all these pathways are here too. All of them are, are at least in one way or another impacted by these pathways called sirtuins. So you need to know about them. We will talk about certain ones more than others. But basically, it's a glucose, it's anti-inflammatory, it's the pathways to cell death, they're all mixed together in a coherent orchestral 
thing that makes some real serious music. But in order to understand how we would be able to derive a strategy that best suits us for aging, we have to understand another set of fundamental principles, and that is that we have to divide, cells have to divide, they have to live and die trillions of times in our lifetime, and approximately 50 to 70 billion times a day, this decision has to be made throughout the body. So I don't know what, where the number is derived from, but it's, it's extensive. So you have to have a mechanism by which you go through your normal lifespan. You know, your gut takes 72 hours, live and die. Your brain, uh, probably a lifetime. Your heart, probably a lifetime. Your liver has the ability to be injured and replicate rapidly, more rapidly than other organs, although none of us are you know, reptiles and we can't cut our tails off and, and get new, new, you know, new arm. But this has to happen fundamentally. So you have this concept of where this is going awry. This is, this, there's strange things going on. We're living in experimental times, as Dr. Lee will say will emphasize. And the question is, well, why? What's Not why, but what is it doing? Because we can, you all know a lot about the why, but what is it fundamentally doing? Well, it's, it's telling ourselves that they, it's okay to go into a almost a hibernating state and stay there and then be exposed to a poor environment and mutate. And then over time, over years, over years now, they may mutate and form cancer cells over time. But it allows it to happen. It's just the whole environmental, uh, sum, the summation of all the different factors allow it to happen, which is something everyone in my office knows about the P53, which is the main, one of the main conductors of, of cell death. But there are many other pathways involved. So the, the problem with the senescence is that it's associated with everything that we call aging. And it also tells the, the neighborhood that we're inflamed, we have, we have w w join us in this particular, you know, great uh, diversion, you know, across the bridge onto the sunny side of life, but it's really the dark side of life. It's the Darth Vader approach to life. So when you, when you delay senescence, you delay all the things that we don't want. You delay the things that produce diabetes, that produce obesity, infl inflammatory states, and so on. So we know that senescence is going to be spawning the field of senolytics. Now, we already will know which, by the end of the lecture, which herbs are senolytic, which, which plants are senolytic. But they're not just senolytic, they're anti-inflammatory. They're, they're good for glucose metabolism. They're good for detoxification. They, they are why we have multi-receptor bodies. We have multi-receptor systems, right? So then you have the other thing, which is the mTOR capacity. So the mTOR is saying, listen, <laughs> I'm 65 years old. I'm starting to get sick. I'm starting to get a little bit weaker. So I got to repair the house, right? So this is now termed in the literature as a general contractor. <laughs> Um, so you don't just demolish the whole thing, and you have to do it in a sequential way. So this is the system that's sensing the environment. So the better you can sense it, the better you can adjust, the more flexible you can adjust. The more gene pathways you have to, to create adjustment strategies, the better you'll do. So you ultimately lead to cells that should be destroyed are destroyed, and that is fundamental. I never understood it until we see it in the clinic where folks are given strategies to reduce their load of senescent cells, and they immediately, within 24 hours, tell you the same thing. Uh, they say, I feel lighter, literally lighter. Now, we, n we haven't studied yet what they're peeing out and so on, which we need to do, of course, but ultimately that's a sense that they have. So this is another fundamental concept I want to leave you with. You cannot be in a state of detoxification, inflammation. You cannot, at the same time, be producing repair. You cannot go forward and backward at the same time. You think, you know, that life is about staying neutral, but it isn't. In order to stay neutral, you have to be promotive. You have to be in a reparative state. So the reason we're not is we're in a pro-inflammatory state. When you measure the C-reactive protein, it's up in a certain amount of pe people, but it's insensitive. 
you go down to the cytokine levels with laboratories at Stanford and so on, you realize that all of us are pro-inflammatory, period. That's the way we live. So you have to have systems in place. And of course, autophagy is, is detoxification in, a, at the highest level. This comes from Dr. Chris Shade, the owner of uh, Quicksilver, the, the liposomal entity that deals with uh, heavy metals and so on. So there are many, many things to talk about, but it's the AMPK that I want to briefly review. But we've heard of the, everyone's heard the inflammatory um, uh, hypothesis for aging, right? Because it's infl inflammation, mitochondria, of course, mitochondria produce, the dysfunction produces the inflammation, but basically you've heard this inflammasome, and the, the thing that you're going to hear more about, much more about, is the, is the nature of the inflammasome this complex of inflammatory proteins that's clustered within cells because it's becoming widely understood that in addition to protein misfolding, that this is fundamental in the neural inflammation that leads to all the neurodegenerative disorders. So Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis are sort of, we already knew, but now we know that the Alzheimer's and the, the cognitive dysfunctions are also related to, 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 to this. And, and when you look when you look at brain fog related to fibromyalgia and to biotoxins and to mold and so on and Lyme, this is the this is what's going on in the cell. So, what am I supposed to do? I have no money versus I have unlimited resources. Let's talk about that. I got no money. Well, then read read <laughs> read what has been validated. What I've been teaching for 15 or 16 years at UCSF and stopped because th there was limited audience to, to talk to there. Well, these are the validated markers for 10-year promotive of health. And they're sort of v very pretty easy. But you need to be at, at the levels. So you need to have your vitamin D level to be, in my opinion, it's above 60 to 80, closer to 100 in my opinion for myself. Hemoglobin A1C, which is the sugar, uh, with the, the sugar marker, target is five. The average one of us probably collectively here is probably in the low fives because we're eating this type of food, not what, not what you get at the hospital. Um, um, I, I remember sending people to the Pritikin Institute 30 years ago when I was at Hopkins because I, tr I treated transplant patients. But at the same time that we were doing that, we were treating them in the ICU with cheeseburgers and the low-fat diet. So we have markers of homocysteine, which is a marker for our B vitamin load and magnesium loads are basically a surrogate marker for overall repair, our inflammatory marker, our oxidative stress. And whether you're peeing in the morning, alkaline, or, 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 or a, a, an acid environment is important because in an acid environment, you're going to make 25% less protein. You just repair 25% less. So, pizza, pasta versus that. The next morning, you'll be a happier person, but it's not as much fun, yeah? <laughs> because ultimately, um, Domino's goes out of business. So basically, you're saying, well, I'm an herbalist type of person. I want only, only natural stuff in my body. Well, this is, this is not a big list. This is a fundamentalist, in my opinion. You can, you can expand the list tenfold, the stuff that you like, but whether you're looking at it from a cardiometabolic perspective, you have anti-inflammatory, you have things that deal with the meta with metabolic systems, you have things that are, um, again, are, are antioxidants and so on and reparatives, but it's the same, it's the same, it's basically the same for, for detoxification. So you have some fundamental things that you can go to to keep on the positive side. And don't forget the fundamental importance of phospholipids. Don't, don't take lightly the issue of what you're going to eat on the good fat side versus the, the neutral or, or, or pro-inflammatory side because this will guide us whether or not we'll be cognitively functioning and, and, more and less impaired as we get a older and older and older and older as we want to. Some of us will at least. And then we have to have a complicated view of detox. 
or at least a complete view, where you have the three systems in, within the liver, and then it's got to move into the circulation, and then it's got to be bound up and pooped out and peed out and so on. That's what the young kid's doing here. He's, he's studying detoxification, <laughs> preferably not on your sofa. But <laughs> then, then you have these systems here, this, AMK, th this fundamental aging system that deals with how are we going to handle our lipids and how are we going to handle the cells that are dying? And the, and the, the, the less cells that are renewing and, and going through renewal and dying, the more fat we're going to, the more, f it's the same system. The fat, the ultimate, that leads to fat, fat uh, aggregation is the same system that's telling you that your detox pathways aren't working. And that's because it's, it's not allowing the cells to normally, that normally should die, to die. So, we have our endogenous stem cell. How many people know that we have our own stem cells in, in, all, in all of our, our bodies? Yeah. So this was, a, this was another observation I had uh, as a pathologist. We had these funny-looking cells around every single blood vessel of the body. We said, oh, these must be just structural, just to provide structure. No, these are the CD34 cells. These are inherent, innate stem cells. So this is another view of it on a scanning microscope. So it's everywhere. And they get exhausted. They get lower in number and they get exhausted. And so, for example, in your knee, you have five different types of innate stem cells. So when you have a study that came out today in the lay press with 6,000 some odd folks, 3,000 got better and 3,000 got worse in terms of cartilage, then no drugs, just, just natural history. So the 3,000 that, that repaired their cartilage, that had better exercise and better weight loss, they can do it on their own. They don't need anything. You don't need it. But it, when, you're, when you have bone and bone arthritis, you've exhausted your own stem cell population, and that's the end of it. So you, you could either get a bolus of it, or you don't, or you can get a knee replacement. But you have all these cells, and they're everywhere in the body. And the majority of the, the, the communication is paracrine. That means when I give you a stem cell treatment in my office, you'll be talking to your own stem cells, and that'll be the overwhelming majority of the impact. The impact doesn't come from the cells that I give you. They're just communicating their stuff, their, their messages. And their messages are more primitive. Primitive equals younger. So it's signaling to go back into a reparative state and signaling for the cells that should be dead to die. So size matters here. <laughs> So, because the big cells get stuck in the lung and the lung uh, parenchyma, I mean the lung microcirculation, and these little exosomes are becoming more popular now. So this is myself uh, uh, with, a, with a thing that's getting, you know, the cells get stuck in the lung and they sit there, they don't get stuck there, they go into the lymphatics and they, they provide benefit. Now, when you take an average client from Asia that comes to San Francisco for aging purposes and says, I don't want anything, I'm not interested in any of this bull, I'm, I'm not going to take anything. I just want my stem cells. They'll come back in six months because they feel as bad as they did when they first got the treatment, but they'll get a benefit for roughly about six months. The smoker is a little bit less so. But you can get a bolus of it when it's safe. And these are the exosomes. It's just not. So we know that everything we do for optimal health is a function of whether it's telomeres, mitochondria, sirtuins, NAD. Um, they're, it's all the same thing. The more, the more important one that I, I think that all of us have to become experts in is intermittent fasting because the majority of us can benefit from it and the majority of us can tolerate it. Some of us can't. But intermittent fasting is the simplest way to talk to your stem cell population because when you're fasting, you induce AMPK and you induce autophagy and that's, that's what's going on. That's why you lose weight even if you ate the same amount as you eat them in, in smaller and smaller windows. So the window that I use is I ate today at, I think, around 3 o'clock. And so from, from, from um, so 3 o'clock, I just ate once today. So the next day I'll eat at 8. So it'll be 17, 18 hours, and I'll feel better. And I used to do that when I was in the OR all the time because I didn't even know I didn't know anything about intermittent fasting. I just knew what it took to be cognitively up, you know, in the morning. So have anyone, has anyone heard of deuterium? Deuterium depletion. Deuterium is going to be an important factor that you're going to know a lot more about. Deuterium is 
the deuterium levels is it's a higher it's a it's a it's a higher form of it's a heavier form of hydrogen and it's in the water supply and the higher the deuterium levels the less likely they are to be helpful other than simply so the hydration will hurt you so depending on what the levels are the hydration just getting hydrated may actually be an anti may be an aging phenomenon so we will eventually be testing, have to test our waters, you know, for what we're buying for either 99 cents or 4.99 for the Fiji water to tell if it's really a difference. But this is really fundamentally important because uh, that higher, uh, higher levels of deuterium have now been associated with every single uh, chronic ailment uh, on the planet. Okay. So I look at it from a convergence perspective. I like to put this word on, and then Wikipedia likes to take it off every few months, so you can't keep it on there. And I think, Susan, you know all about that. Um, so we have a system where we have, there are folks here, experts in functional medicine. We also believe that this is part of the future. Regenerative medicine is part of the future of medicine. We have a molecular approach, too, because we don't, we don't, we like data. I like it. I just don't treat it the same way as the average colleague of mine at UCSF and Stanford does. But then we use other things too, so there are experts here, we can't get into them in detail. I also wanna say that archetypal medicine, as I call it, which is, it could be Chinese, it could be homeopathic, constitutional, Korean systems, they're important because it sort of gives you a little bit more of a lever. But, but as it comes down to cellular health. So the last slide is this. The last set of slides is you have to have a diagnostic screen, a, a set of diagnostic tests. This is my list for you to, to take a photograph of, but it's not trivial. And you don't need it. It's just better. <laughs> More data it can be better if it's properly analyzed. But you have measures of neuro, you know, cognitive function, heart rate variability, sleep, vascular, all these other phenomena. You have a lab, set of laboratory testing. And these are becoming more and more and more common. So now everyone, everyone, 95%, not everyone, 95% of all of our cancer patients have significant loads of heavy metals, significant loads of mold biotoxins. They just do, and they're a little bit higher than the general population, but the general population has already shifted in the eight years that I've been in practice to 20, 30, 40%, now it's 50, 60, 70% of all of us are carrying these biotoxic loads. And that's because we're overwhelming our, our innate systems a bit more every decade. That's all. We just are. And this is what we're, this is the times that we live. It's not to be frightened of it, just to be aware of it so that you should be a bit more motivated cognitively with behavioral therapy to, to do something about it. And then the therapeutics are any, any, any one of these. Though we do think that peptides are, are part of the future. We do think that stem cells can be if these are at this point not, uh, not covered by standard insurances and so on. Uh, and you, you need to have an anti-inflammatory reparative strategy. So follow the, at minimum, follow the guidances of the, of the predictive biomarkers. It's not hard to, vitamin D is about $10 a month. It's not hard to find a good magnesium preparation or you get it with food. It's not hard to find uh, a set of anti-inflammatory foods to eat. It's not hard to, to bring your oxidative stress markers down. And it's not hard to find some good I mean, you could just follow the Budwig protocol. This genius biochemist from Spain who just passed away, she puts low-fat low cottage cheese and mixes it up with flaxseed oil, and there, therein lies a genius thing to, to take for the rest of your life, one tablespoon a day of that sort of gamish. If you want it to, if you want it to taste good, you add some vanilla and honey to it. Otherwise, you, you just take, it, take one for the team and then you'll be in good shape. And then, of course, the IV therapeutics. So this is the new language. Be aware of it. But, but, my, but my opinion and my strategy and my recommendations for you is to not go this route. This comes from a colleague of mine at Hopkins, um, <laughs> Eric Topol, who was the genius behind all the, all, the lipid, all the statin trials and all the ischemia trials that we ran initially together and then he went off to head the Cleveland Clinic 
but he's into digital medicine. And I say, good, that's great. Get the data. But garbage data in leads to garbage data. So if you're not measuring any of the drivers of aging, then how do you know whether your drug works or not? How, how could you possibly know if it couldn't work in this person because it had no, it had no juice? There was nothing there to provide it with the substrate. So we could either go this route or, or take some, some less hysterical view of this. And then it's important to, to, to measure your gauges, and that's fundamental, but when you go like my brother just had cardiac surgery in New York. I asked them to check his vitamin D. They said, why? I said, well, the same reason why I'm concerned that the only food you're giving him is Jell-O. <laughs> I'm fundamentally concerned with that. I said, can you please do me a favor and do it? They didn't. didn't. But do the gauges. And if you're concerned with, with some things, and be concerned with the communications network. Be concerned with the wiring. But that's not it. That's not all of it. So remember this. If you're going to have a strategy, take it from the conductor's view and then take it from the first violinist, the first violist, the first flautist, and let it, let it sort of scan down the rest of the cascade. Because unless you do that, you're still stuck with a, with a strategy that isn't as robust enough as it takes to deal with our particular experimental times that we live in right now. So this comes from the father of medicine in the United States. Uh, Osler was the first chairman of medicine at Hopkins. And this, he would be appalled at the state of affairs today because he was fundamentally a person who was an integrative doctor. He was an observationalist. He did physical exams. Things that we no longer focus on, but really observing little details. And then come up with one drug or one strategy, it could be curcumin, one drug for 20 disorders rather than 20 drugs for each disorder. And I thank you for your time and attention. <laughs> oh, I did. Oh, okay, good. I'm just on time then. Fantastic. Um, so if we can get. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if we can get the other mic. I've been looking on the source of all knowledge, the uh, internet, and there's been lots of articles about carbon-60 and the rather spectacular results people are getting from them. The theory is, is that it promotes uh, the death of senescent cells, and also it is a free radical sponge, and it's also a hydrogen sponge, and both of those things are useful to keep around hydrogen next to the free radicals. I've been doing it myself for a while, and I've noticed some very interesting effects, but an experiment of one is not very useful, except for me. However, you didn't even mention carbon-60. That's too, too beyond the, it's too far beyond the horizon. You haven't heard about it? No, I, no, I, haven't, de I haven't dealt with it in detail, so no, I don't know. Well, it's, it's important enough that some of the major drug companies are starting to put out trash talk on it. So it's gonna, it means it's going to affect their profits. So that's actually a good sign for me. So for what it's worth, you might want to look at it. But I think, you know, I'll look into it now that you've said that you've said you've you've had a good observer has had good a good result because it still is the, the pathways that I want to affect are being affected, and it's rational. And you're right that listen, when we get to a point where we can age more gracefully, that's great. Now, when I come, when people come to the office and say now, because these are the Silicon Valley um, you know, types, and I want to live to 120. I said, well, does, are your parents speak Yiddish? <laughs> no, because biz 100 Svansik is a usual thing that we say in, in the community, but no. So why do you want, oh, well, because the guy next door to me said he wants to live to 100, so I'm going to live to 120. I said, well, the next guy comes in the next day and he says, I want to live to 130. I said, why? He goes, well, because my next door neighbor said he wants to live to 120. I said, well, what do you want to do? Well, it's a whole different story. I just want to make sure that I, I'm you know, good. So what are you doing? There's nothing. Well, what do you know about? Well, I'm not, yeah, you're going to tell me what to do. I said, oh, OK, I'll tell you what to do. So, well, tell me your history. I said, well, I'm 62. I recently remarried, got some young kids. 
and I've had my first heart attack at 52 and the second one at 56. I said, well, you need a seven-week plan, not a 70-year plan. Let's start with a seven-week plan, and that's the person who invariably never comes back because it's too you know, insulting. It's insulting to the intelligence that you derive from doing great work in the financial world versus the intelligence you, you apply to yourself, basically on what, what you're observing. You're observing your colleagues getting sicker and sicker and sicker, and then you have to deal with why they're, why, not necessarily why, but this is the reality. The reality is we have certain people who will do much better than others, and these principles will guide that. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could say anything more about the deuterium levels in water, kind of like, is it based on the source, or if you filter is it, does that change it? Or no, no, so, yeah, I don't know. Like There's a very sophisticated filtration system to get lower deuterium levels. There, there are two entities, um, uh, one is called Life uh, Light Water. Uh, I, we began using it in the clinic because it's easier to purchase. Um, but you, you have to go low and slow because most of us have deuterium levels at around 200, 220, and we have to go down slowly because if you just take a pure shot, you'll feel de you'll have a detox reaction, you'll have a Herx reaction. But as you slowly bring yourself to lower deuterium levels, um, when when cancer patients do that, they do roughly better in the, small, in the small groups that we've studied. But there's a very sophisticated metab metabolomics group, metabolomics group at UCLA, um, um, run by, what's his name? Uh, yeah, I forgot, I'm blocking in his name. Um, I'll apologize for that, I'll remember in a minute. But uh, run by a very sophisticated uh, group that is, is the same group that deals with, that publishes, the, these, these are the editors of some of the best cancer journals and understanding the linkages, but, but there are products now. I think uh, the source of all knowledge, you know, Mercola.com, <laughs> also has quite a number of pieces on it and so on, so. But it's worthwhile thinking about um, um, following the literature on it. Yes? Is this, is this on? Hi, that's a great talk. Um, as a practicing integrative physician, I would love to know how to learn more about peptides. Mm -hmm. I know A4M has some seminars, wondering yeah. about their quality. And I guess a follow-up on that is, do you take, would you take a disciple? Because I'm finding a lack of mentorship and I would love to come and see what you do in your clinic. And I think I have a colleague here who feels the same way. <laughs> right, well, so to answer the question, some of the high-level leadership at A4M is now coming over to ACAM because it's become a bit, uh, you know, it, it, is a, it is a very important resource. I love going there. I'll be there this year. I love going to the, you know, to the vendor space and teasing out some, some good ideas from that space. Um, but it's a bit on, too, on the commercialized side, and it also is a bit dummied down. So ACAM is more on the, most of the master's level. Uh, level, but but one of the biggest gaps that we all have is mentorship, right? So, as the office folks know, we've mentored any number of different folks, and we'll do so on a case by case basis. But the the peptides, uh, I teach a course twice a year on stem cells and peptides because I think they need to be studied together, even if they're not practiced together, because they're, they're the, the the science behind them is synergistic. But if you look up the the best in my opinion, the only and the best peptide source in the United States is called TaylorMade, right? And that, I think, is the one that has the best process that will be able to go through FDA and be around next year and the year after and be able to sustain that regulatory excellence and the good manufacturing practices. And it's, it's a very strange phenomenon that something that's as potent as a peptide that could you know, uh, make you lose weight, that can make you cognitively better and so on, is not considered a drug. It's just a, a, a small peptide, which is amino acid chain, and it's still not considered a drug, even though they're as potent or more potent. So uh, look, A4M has the peptide course this year. I just looked it up this morning. It's funny because Dr. Seeds, who's the founder of the International Peptide Society, is the only speaker. At, he's giving all the lectures. I said, well, that's, so we have multiple peptide speakers, but at the same time, you better like them because you're going to get them all day. But, but I don't know exactly what happened. But, that, but it is a worthwhile thing to pursue. So if you're interested in, in, in talking after, but 
we we'll get a card from someone in the front here uh, or over there, and then we'll figure out. I don't. We don't. We just trying to save ourselves. Uh, the, to to do uh, to do the the real practitioners. That's all. Yeah. Sir, do you think that uh, three meals a day is a mistake? Yes, I do fundamentally. Now, I'm not talking about the tenth percentile on either side. You know, I'm just not sure. I, I know for the bulk of the population, that can, you know, that doesn't feel terrible. And and I could now we have the the now we have the continuous glucose monitors, and you could see. So you could tease out the few people that may, may fall out of this, but absolutely, I, I think that um, the concept of hunter-gatherers, the hunters went out, the guys, macho guys, we, you know, we only came up with the, with the beef, uh, you know, a few times a week, maybe if we're lucky, and so we, we ate, you know, what we had, and, and the, the farming done by the, the women in the tribe sustained us, so we had a lot of fiber. But the fiber today, if you ate it, as much fiber as Dr. Lee will explain, it will kill us because the, the, the pesticides in the fiber will just be so poisonous. So right now, you're just better off training your body as it was meant to be with these pathways. These pathways are meant, the mTOR pathways are built for fasting. They're, that's what they're built for. They're optimized during fasting period. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Yom Kippur, we don't drink either, but you, by the end of the day, you're very agitated because <laughs> your, glu you know, your glucose levels are low, but you feel as sharp as can be. So I think that that's a general statement that most people would agree with, but uh, I know we have a lot of folks that, that I know are, are very good uh, fasters in here. Now, whether you do it once a week, 24 hours, or twice a month, or once a month, I, you know, I'm not the, the world authority on this, but I think understanding how what your limits are and training yourself into this but but the but the embarrassment is is that we've been trained that breakfast is the most important thing well maybe it is maybe it isn't some people then then why are you why are you eating then at 11 o'clock at night watch and the funny thing is they're watching fitness videos eating potato chips at 11 o'clock at night well <laughs> it's not not very rational right but but YouTube will train you how to become a trainer while you're eating the potato chips and not even recognizing them. So it's just a flawed system. Yes, yes. Hold on. Yeah, thank you for the awesome uh, presentation and the detail and so forth. I, would, I was wondering if, if you've done research or you've seen cases of healing by, uh, if you've seen healing by um, um, spontaneous remission or faith or, uh, or, 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 or in those kind of things and so forth, or uh, meditation? Um, yes, I think that <clears throat> I've seen it. I, I, I hear the stories about them and validated stories. But uh, just to say that it's, it's almost like um, do you, um, you want to have a strategy that's more likely than not going to lead to a certain result? So that the odds are against you, but but there are there are one of the more one of the most interesting cases that I've ever come across was is a patient with multiple personality disorders that only had a specific condition when they had the certain personality. So yes, you can and you can and that was modifiable in two or three days. A serious illness that you wouldn't imagine could be reversed or disappear in a three day period would disappear when she entered into another personality. So things happen that are weird, and this is not weird that this is, you know, the brain is controlling a great deal of, of our repair resources. So I'd say I, I, I tell my patients that, that, that the, emotional <clears throat> the emotional component, the, the, the past trauma components, the faith components are fundamental. It's one of the pillars. But by the way, um, we are. It's not our complete expertise. We're not going to focus on it because we're, we're a treatment center. We're going to be focusing on other things that we will support you for. Yeah. Hold on. Just a brief interjection. I wondered if yes. you agree, but I think the mind is one of the most powerful yeah, absolutely. elements. But I think most of us are pretty you know, bad at controlling and, and optimizing it. But I think that's on the horizon.
Is it possible to get the slides even before they appear on the website? I mean, they should appear on the website within a few weeks, but is well, there I know. any possibility? Susan, do, you, do we share these slides with? No, I'm saying, but do we do we do? Do you share it with your constituents? Um, I don't know. Well, I don't. I don't remember doing that. But, uh, but no, yeah, we but, don't. But no, but under special circumstances, possibly yes. But in general, no, because I the reason I I was able to give this particular lecture with other people's slides is because we just ran our national meeting, and so I congregated a lot with their permission. Congregated a lot of the slides. The way that we but, do deliver the slides is on yeah, the video the as we yeah, yes. finalize the. Yeah, yeah, month, yeah. Okay, still a little bit of time. Any other questions? Do you consider uh, the micro microbioma yeah. in I your approach? That, I'll leave that to Dr. Lee, and she, you'll hear you'll hear from her. Yes, okay. yes. It, it again, it's a it's fundamental to our communications network. Yes. What's your uh, recommended uh, fasting schedule? Or well, again, uh, it's uh, it's up to you, but it's uh, it's uh, you get a little bit more coverage when you hit f you get the basic coverage at 14 hours. Uh, but if you want to be 100 percent assured that you're gonna get it, you, you at, you're at 16 you're at 16 plus hours, so 16 to 18 hours. But but it's it's hard to be social. And, and eat in a six-hour window or a four-hour window. It's very hard to be social, like, you know, have dinner with your children and then have breakfast with colleagues in the morning because you're talking about no calories, talking about just black coffee. Uh, 30 calories takes you out of the fast. It does Still, you get some benefits, but not the, the, the pure benefits that's putting your autophagy in place. So, so it's, it's 16 to 18 hours when you're doing it. Now, you can go wild when you're not doing it. Just don't eat garbage. Might as well ask a question. Um, great talk. Uh, any uh, a question on? Oh. Um, do you know of any downside of using analytics? Uh, I've seen some data to the extent that it would cause telomere shortening and potentially stem cell exhaustion yeah. if you uh, do too aggressively. And what's the what's the optimal protocol here? Well, no one knows the as you know, no one knows the answers to these questions. So it reminds me of the time that when we were driving the, the, the knowledge of how to open coronary arteries in the 80s at Hopkins, and we knew how to do it. And we started training people. We trained the people around, and a lot of people, not, not hundreds, but a lot of people died because the pressure was too much and they ruptured the vessels. They didn't understand the nuance, and that something that ultimately became exceptionally popular and exceptionally effective was at first dangerous. And that's exactly where we are, in my opinion, with the senolytics. So when you go fly to Long Island to get your prescription for rapamycin, you, you, you may, in fact, get a benefit, and you may not. You may, in fact, not stay neutral. You may have a promotive of tumor angiogenesis. You may get, so we don't know how to predict yet. So I, I'm, I'd rather wait myself. And now on the metformin side, it's the same thing. But it's a, it's a less dangerous uh, sort of uh, terrain to, to function in than rapamycin. Although, again, there are folk, plenty of folks who are, who are just beginning to tell us what they feel on it and what they've measured on it. But it's very hard to measure a mitochondrial effect because if you're well, why would you feel any different tomorrow? You're just not older, but you, you wouldn't feel it. If you're ill, if you took it for a few months, you may have some suggestions and, 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 and signals that you're on the, on, the, on the right side. I think that many of the products that we currently have, when you go to A4M and you see these TA-165s and these niagens and other things, they're more difficult to tease out as I've had patients that, that still take them and it's not clear exactly what the effects are. So we're looking for something that's as strong as the potential effect of rapamycin, but doing it in a, safe, in a safer way. And I'd rather do the, the following philosophy. In three years' time, things will be different. That's my 
the summation of all that I know is it'll tell you that three years' time, things will be, options will grow dramatically. So if you keep yourself neutral, you'll be in better shape than taking all the risks and you know, swallowing all the different you know, senolytics. You know, uh, you've done a wonderful job. I, I do think, though, that uh, the book that's just out is going to advance things really well, and that is uh, David Sinclair's book that came out in September, uh, Lifespan. I mean, I've been reading it. I think it's going to change the world. And uh, I recommend it to everybody. It's really yeah. a good read. And, uh, and, and a lot of the things that uh, Dr. Erskowitz has talked about are spelled out there. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of, you know, they, they go, you can take your time with this. So it's a little yeah. bit easier to grasp it than Dr. Erskowitz is yeah, covering a lot of ground. Yeah, and then we could all meet the next year and the yeah. years next be, and then figure out how we're going to survive as a society mm -hmm. with many of us living into our 90s and 100. That's a whole different story. Lifespan by Sinclair. Sinclair. Got enough time for one more question. Do you see benefit on uh, taking oral NAD? Yeah, well, um, no, I don't. But uh, but it's a good idea. But it's the it's a kinetic experiment. So the pharmacokinetics of the oral. So it's probably it may be beneficial if you take it intramuscularly. Um, not subcutaneously, and then there are there there are company there are pharmacies in in the United States that have iontophoresis patches where you could it breaks the the you know the skin barrier with these electrical sort of pads, and um, we're testing those right now. But right now, I could say that no one has tried it as as has said they have spectacular effects. So right now, it's it's an issue of getting enough on board. So. Liposomal preparations have been impossible to pr to produce yet. Then that that's the next innovation. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's thank Dr. Herskowitz. Thank you.